if the only thing you know about the end times is the um, Left Behind series, this sermon is for you. You will, uh, you, you need to hear from me that the Left Behind series, these are novels. Uh, they have almost nothing of uh, real biblical content. But I like adventure novels, okay? I read uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, would not be found in the scriptures. But still, hey, there it is. So as we look at what it means to talk about the end times, I have chosen a passage of scripture that is more mysterious and isn't going to help determine what all of that means. I um, I have known for some time that I was going to preach on this general topic and specifically about that question, what's on the other side of the door, which is uh, uh, take off from the scripture lesson for this sermon. And then yesterday, yesterday, just as I was leaving the house, I heard a knock on the door. Well, okay, it was an electric, electronic knock. It was our doorbell. But at, anyway, there was someone at my door. And I'm thinking, no, wait a minute. So let's, be, let's be steady here. Let's be sure that I don't overreact. So I went to the door and opened it to find two gentlemen there all dressed up. And this, um, And I said, okay, either I have uh, Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses at my door because these guys are not Mormons. I could, I could tell. We've all, I think, had people knocking on our door. Uh, this is the time of year when they could be politicians, too. But this, is, this, was, this was clearly, I mean, they had books in their hands. And uh, as they expressed themselves to me, it was clear that... Uh, that they were Jehovah's Witnesses. They had a watchtower uh, flyer, and uh, and okay, I've I've that's not the first time I've been in this rodeo, okay, and and I'm kind of an honor guy, and I didn't want just to say uh, I don't need this. Thank you very much. Go away. I prefer to engage folk who come to my door, and my usual story is I. I am a Christian. This is a Christian household. I'd like you to come in and hear my witness. Uh, this never is accepted. <laughs> I have yet to have it accepted. So, okay, I'm honoring. So we, we had a conversation about this, and we exchanged some of, our, uh, some of our thoughts, and I expressed my difference in beliefs about what they brought to my door, and, and finally I said, you know, perhaps I'm wasting your time. If, if it is your task to find folk who have not yet experienced the Christian faith, then probably let's just say goodbye. I have my faith, and I am a believer, and I think our task is to find others who have not yet had that experience, have not, I didn't say it, but haven't been through that door. And they were quite gracious in saying, thank you very much. I think they were glad to be turned loose. <laughs> um, I did in the process confess to them that I was a pastor and that, uh, you know, I'd been at this something more than a half century. So it was, it was a good conversation. But here they are knocking at my door. We never know when something knocks on the door of our lives what's going to be there. And furthermore, we're not always sure which side of the door we're standing on. Many of the images of this passage of Scripture from the book of Revelation showed Jesus at the door. And, the, and the, the, the passage of Scripture is, Behold, I stand at the door. I'm standing at the door knocking. 
let me in. That's a paraphrase. But this passage of Scripture is not our usual image of the end times. And yet here it is in one of the most powerful, apocalyptic, hmm, that's a big word, apocalyptic pieces of, of Scripture in the whole Bible. Apocalyptic, by the way, is revelation. It's another word for something being revealed. So when a door is open, something is revealed to us. And it is a part of our understanding of the faith that there is more to our understanding than what we have. There is more to be understood. There is more yet to be revealed to us. And that door it often stands between us and that adventure. It's an adventure to be a part of the faith. It's an adventure to open that door. It's an adventure to answer the knock. We have things happen to us in our lives that take us places we had never expe expected to go. It takes us in places that we had expected to be. We often have a door open to us that has an adventure with it that we were not expecting. This congregation, speak, move from ourselves to this congregation, this congregation has been on an adventure for a while. Actually, it didn't start just a uh, half dozen years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, this congregation has been on advent an adventure for several decades. It will be 50 years five decades in this location come next spring. Well, what does an adventure look like for a congregation? Well, one of the stories that you might not need to hear is how this congregation came to have a new cornerstone set out here by this door. What does that, what does that cornerstone say? What does it symbolize? What does it mean to have a new cornerstone in Christ? This congregation answered a knock at a door and a new cornerstone ended up under the old one. An adventure. This congregation set out on an adventure that has to do with changing the order of worship that took place after the cornerstone we have a different kind of music we have a, a different kind of worship service and it has been an adventure Ad adventures bring us things we didn't expect to find when we open the door we're never sure just what is on the other side some of you have become part of this congregation within the last decade or so. Some of you have been a part of this congregation for several decades. Each of you in those two circumstances have found things along the way that you had not expected. And a part of our task as a congregation and as individuals is to find our way to God's adventure in that process. What is it? What's God doing with us? Is it just God or is it just circumstance? A part of the end time is not about the end at all, but right now. That's, that's a part of, of, of what the end time means, is how is God's kingdom, God's presence, a part of my reality right now. And then what? We'll wait for the rest of the adventure. My, uh, it's my mother's fault that I learned about hobbits. Okay? Um, my mom and my mom uh, discovered hobbits in the in the 60s when the second rash of uh, 
of the reading of The Hobbit came about and before The Lord of the Rings became such a big deal uh, around our society. Um, just for the record, The Hobbit was written in 1937. Okay? That's before me, okay? I just, sorry, just to let you know. I was in seminary at the time, and my mom was reading this book, The Hobbit, and she had little figurines of hobbits um, on, on a coffee tail, the table in their home. And she had a, a, a table book of hobbits. Now, just, just for those of you who have not been initiated into the adventure of the hobbit yet, uh, a hobbit is a halfling, a half size, hu half the size of a human being. And, um, and they like several breakfasts. They eat a lot and often. And they don't wear shoes because they have big feet with heavy soles on their feet on the bottom and a lot of hair on top of their, or their feet. They're really a kind of a peculiar looking creature. They're gentle, uh, sometimes gullible, and sometimes adventurous. Now the beginning of The Hobbit, the story, is about Bilbo Baggins. Okay, Bilbo's the name of a hobbit. And he's, um, he's been a hobbit all of his life. And he's kind of a laid back guy. Things have been going well for him. He's kind of comfortable in his life. He lives in a very, very comfortable hole in the ground, only it's not like any ordinary hole in the ground. It's, it's just, it's a very comfortable home. And his door had a knock come to it. Somebody came to his door knocking on it, and, uh, and it was Gandalf. Now, can, can we find another creature here? Gandalf is a wizard. He's a little taller than most human beings, and he lives, I don't know how old he is, but he kept living a long time. And he's got some rather spiritual powers, including being able to do fireworks when no one else can do fireworks. But Gandalf, the wizard with a tall pointy hat on his head and a, and a cape over him, came to the door when actually... Bilbo was sitting outside on his porch smoking a very long pipe. Now, I'm not recommending pipes, but, but hear me through. Bilbo wasn't very excited to see Gandalf. But Gandalf had an idea for an adventure for Bilbo that Bilbo wasn't ready for. The next day, the knocks kept coming on Bilbo's door, and one dwarf, okay, dwarfs are another creature. They're even smaller, I believe, than hobbits, but they're very small creatures, and they often live underground, and they do marvelous things with metals and mining and things like that. But they kept coming to his door, and hobbits are hospitable. Bilbo welcomed these dwarfs in. They'd been kind of warned in an offhand way by Gandalf that this was going to happen, and 13 dwarves ended up coming one at a time and in groups to his door. And one of the things about adventures, Bilbo suggested, was that it will make you late for supper. An adventure will make you late for supper. And here's Bilbo trying to feed all of these people, uh, give them the, the liquid refreshment that they prefer, and he finds out that he's been recruited to be a part of an adventure they're taking off on to go retrieve the treasure that the dwarfs had lost many years before. Well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story of The Hobbit. I, I do. Uh, it's available now uh, in paperback again. I, You know, if you kind of... It's worth a shot for you, even if that's not your usual genre of reading material. Bilbo was not expecting, when he got recruited into this adventure, he was not expecting to meet giant eagles. He was not expecting to meet a greedy dragon. 
He was not expecting to meet goblins. He was not expecting to meet Gollum, the little creature who had once been a hobbit who was so contaminated by the ring he found that Bilbo also found that he became a whole different kind of person. Bilbo also found that ring, a ring that would make you disappear visually and at the same time would begin to own your very soul. When Bilbo set out on this adventure, he wasn't expecting that. He did not anticipate that the appearance of Gandalf at his door would lead in this direction. There are folk in this congregation who have answered that door, who have received that knock, and have found an adventure that is as stunning and as upsetting and as exciting as what Bilbo got into. I commend it to you. Uh, let me give you some, some ideas about that. There are folk who have found Christian service here in a way that they have never had before. Others have found ways of being in servant ministry here that they had heard before but had not really gotten into it. Um, we have folk who came here from far other places, far away places, across the metro, who found here a kind of hospitality and a kind of warmth and receptivity that they had been seeking. And some of them are singing here. Some of them are teaching in our Sunday school classes at this moment. There are four classes out there, one for youth and three for children. Some of our congregation have been around for a while and find a whole different kind of kids here than they had seen when their own kids were a part of this church. We have folk who have been a part of Bible study and found adventure in that that they had never quite anticipated. Now, I have gotten a special permission from Barbara to offer you something of an adventure. Uh, Barbara is leading Disciple 2. It's a, it's a 30, uh, get this adventure, 34-week course in the Bible that expects three hours a week of reading and study, and you come on a Saturday morning for two hours, three hours, okay, I didn't even have the adventure right, but for three hours in a small group you study what you have been working with, and you have studied literature with you. That adventure can be life transforming. If you have been kind of afraid of the Bible before and haven't been ready to answer the knock on the door that says, hey, come in, or you don't know who's out there, I invite you to consider that possibility of being in an adventure of a serious Bible study, one that will make you late for supper, one that will take you away from some of the things that you work on through the week ordinarily. It is a life-changing kind of a reality. That door, you hear it? It's being knocked on. This, uh, this passage of Scripture is fascinating. This message is, it comes as a message to Laodicea, and it's uh, to the, this little chapter is written to the angel of Laodicea. Now, I, now, I, I want to say about the book of Revelation, if you claim to understand the book of Revelation, I think you're nuts. Scholars, serious Christians, Many folk have worked hard at unlocking and trying to understand what's here. And we're not sure why there are seven angels and seven, and seven cities. There, one of the things that apocalyptic material often does is it uses numbers, numerology. The three of this and seven of that. And some, we don't know what those mean. 
the book of Revelation is written in code and we don't have the code book. Hear this. Listen. I'm standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. I hope you hear the hobbits in the background chuckling. I, I, ho I hope you hear that. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. What? Just as I myself conquered and sat down on, with my father on his throne, let anyone who has an ear listen to the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I want to close with this story. At the beginning of this, it is written to people who were being greedy. That's a part of the prelude in this chapter. People who were being greedy, yeah, maybe like miniatures of the dragon Smog, who was a greedy dragon with a big treasure. Maybe that was the case. It also was written to a people who were not only greedy, but who were kind of laid back about everything. Um, it's about people who were neither hot nor cold, but were lukewarm. And this is, a this is at the beginning of this, it's, you're going to get spit out of the mouth of God for being lukewarm. I'll leave you with this story. I used to be in Rotary, and I attended Rotary, and I often got asked to do the prayer. I hated it. I, I wanted other people to do the prayers because it's not just clergy who can do prayers. But okay, I did it from time to time. And all through the beginning of the meal, people were complaining about the food. Guess what? What was supposed to be cold wasn't cold. And what was supposed to be hot wasn't hot. The coffee wasn't even hot. It was just complain, complain, complain about all of this. This is not hot. This is not cold. My prayer. Dear God, thank you for hot. Thank you for cold. Deliver us from lukewarm. Amen. Amen.